as a reminder, as many of you know, this series was founded last spring with the help of a generous bequest from the Quinn family. My co-director Jim Keenan and I have been asked over the coming years to bring to campus local, national, and international leaders to address timely issues in the intersecting fields of health, humanities, and ethics. And in this, we see BC taking an important leadership role in a vital arena of healthcare and ethics. We're very grateful to the Park Street Corporation for their generous gift, which aligns the late Father Quinn's interest in social justice and ethics so well with the mission of Boston College. And this year, we've asked undergraduates to introduce our invited, invited speakers, and we'll follow that plan tonight. So I'll introduce Emily Sokol to you, and she in turn will introduce Megan O'Rourke. So I got to know Emily, now a senior, several years ago when she took the introductory course that I teach in medical humanities here at Boston College. An English major, weighing her options between medical school and programs in public health at the moment. Um, Emily's interests were, as she noted at the, at the time, strongly shaped by a burgeoning sense of the important connections between narrative and medicine. Emily's commitment to that sense has been borne out by her work for the Medical Humanities Journal here at Boston College, her organization of a graduate-undergraduate conference on illness narrative last year, and most recently, her leadership in organizing a, an upcoming symposium in narrative medicine that will be held at the Brigham and Women's Hospital in downtown Boston actually next Friday, so I can sort of put in a small plug for that on April 7th, that people who are interested in attending can register for that online. So it's actually co-hosted by Emily and uh, Christy DeFranco at the Brigham, who's a clinical educator. In addition, Emily has worked as a medical scribe, served as research assistant at Yale Cancer Center, and last summer worked as edi editorial assistant under Atul Gawande at Ariadne Labs. For all these reasons, Emily seems ideally suited to introduce tonight's speaker. And before I ask you to join me in thanking Emily for helping to get this evening's event started, a few logistics. Following this evening's talk, there'll be time for questions. Um, we have books, uh, Megan O'Rourke's books are for sale just outside this room, and Megan has graciously agreed to stay here to sign them, so um, if you're interested in purchasing some of her books, you can do that following the talk. If everybody now would just make sure that your cell phones are silent, um, then you can join me in um, thanking our guests and in thanking Emily for introducing her. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this evening's Park Street Corporation Series. As Professor Bosky said, my name is Emily Sokol and I'm a senior English major, medical humanities minor, and on a pre-med track. Tonight, I have the distinct honor of introducing to you Megan O'Rourke. When I originally decided that I wanted to become a doctor, I feared that I would be unable to continue pursuing my passion for English. Uh, it is work like Megan's, which I find inspiring for being able to bring these two worlds together so seamlessly. It is truly an honor to be in her presence this evening. A Yale graduate, Megan currently teaches at Princeton and New York University. She is an award-winning author for her memoir, The Long Goodbye, which chronicles her grieving process after her mother passed away from cancer. Not only does this memoir show the bond between a mother and a daughter, but it teaches us what it means to mourn in today's society. I believe that Megan has the unique knack for writing about topics that we don't like to talk about in today's society. She creates a comfort in the discomfort by making her personal story one that is universally relatable. In two of her more recent pieces, she discusses the topic of physicians diagnosing chronic illness after her personal experience of being diagnosed with Lyme disease. These pieces capture not only Megan's struggle with doctor visit after doctor visit, but also address a larger fundamental problem in our healthcare system. Are we treating our patients as humans or as their disease? These pieces have helped me, as hopefully a future physician, look at the type of doctor that I want to be, how I want to treat my patients. In a society where physicians are trained to treat acute problems rather than chronic illness, it is essential that I do not fall into this trap. Chronic illness is something patients struggle with daily, yet doctors are not equipped to treat, 
to treat them. In her 2014 piece in The Atlantic, Doctors Tell All, and It's Bad, Megan writes, Ours is a technology proficient but emotionally deficient, an inconsistent medical system that is best at treating acute, not chronic problems. For every instance of ex expert treatment, skilled surgery, or innovative problem solving, there are countless cases of substandard care, overlooked diagnoses, bureaucratic bungling, and even outright antagonism between doctor and patient. For a system that invokes patient-centered care as a mantra, modern medicine is startlingly in inattentive, at times actively indifferent to patients' needs. So while technical, technological advance, advances in our healthcare system are improving dramatically, our treatment of the patients is not necessarily. We have the ability to diagnose countless diseases for which we were unable to just a few years prior, but now we are facing a new struggle. How do doctors help their patients emotionally through a disease or illness? Megan's writing is not afraid to tackle this difficult subject. She is not afraid to say that our healthcare system is not doing enough. Doctors are not spending enough time with their patients and they are not answering patients' questions about chronic illness. How can they when the average time spent with a patient is only eight minutes? I used to believe that the world of healthcare and narrative did not overlap. But through my studies as both an English major and a medical humanities minor, I see that it is essential that these two fields overlap. There is a need, there is a need to place story in the context of healthcare and a need to place healthcare in stories. Narrative medicine has the power not only to share a story, but to make a difference. It points to what is wrong in our healthcare system and calls for a change. It has a healing power for the individual relating to the story, to our healthcare workers, and to our larger healthcare field. Megan's work truly embodies the power of narrative medicine. Her ability to share a personal story, yet make it universally relatable, calls us all to look at healthcare in a different light. She brings her own humanity into her writing and begs us to bring humanity into our healthcare system. I am truly excited to hear Megan's talk this evening. And with that, please join me in welcoming to Boston College, Megan O'Rourke. Thank you for that really beautiful and gracious introduction. I appreciate it. I'm just going to get myself settled here. I have several microphone possibilities, so bear with me for one moment. Um, so it's really a great pleasure to be here with all of you tonight um, in, in Boston. I was here two years ago as a fellow at the Radcliffe Institute researching this book. Um, which then has been on hold for a little bit because I had a child. And so I have just um, recently dived back into this project and this is a kind of wonderful way to, to do that with you tonight. Um, so yes, I'm a, I'm a poet and nonfiction writer and my, my last book was about death. So I, my joke is that I'm moving in the right direction um, from death toward illness. Someday I'll get toward, I don't know. Um, and this, I'm going to talk to you and read at, at you, with you, a little bit tonight. I'm going to sort of read some passages from the book and also talk a bit more informally. The book is, has, a, has no title yet, but I call it What's Wrong With Me in, in my head. Um, that was the name of an article I published in The New Yorker that the book is growing out of. And the book is about, in particular, what I think of as poorly understood chronic illnesses. So not any kind of chronic illness, but in particular categories of chronic illness where our understanding is lagging behind our ability to make some kind of diagnosis. So it's really this place of um, being uncertain that I'm very interested in. Tonight I'm gonna to talk particularly about um, a category of chronic illness called autoimmunity or autoimmune diseases, and we're gonna kind of dive into that a little bit. Um, and the aim of the book is, there's a few, but one is to really animate the experience of being a patient from the inside out, while at the same time trying to identify things that I think are getting in our way um, and getting in the way of the healthcare system. So I think of this book as being a kind of a hybrid of my interests as a poet and as my work as a cultural critic, which I've done for a long time. So that said, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my story. 
Illness narratives usually have startling beginnings. The fall at the supermarket, the lump discovered in the abdomen, the doctor's call. Not mine. I got sick the way Hemingway says you go broke, gradually and then suddenly. One way to tell the story is to say that I was ill for a long time, probably about 10 years, before I realized I had a disease or before any doctor I saw realized I had one. Another way to tell the story is to say I got sick in 2009. Um, which was the year after my mother died, and um, the year during which I had a debilitating fatigue. My lymph nodes ached, my brain seemed enveloped in a thick gray fog, and a test suggested that I had three viruses active in my system, including Epstein-Barr, which is mono. Um, another way to tell the story, though, would be to say that it began in February of 2012, three years later, on a windy beach in Vietnam, when my partner and I were reading it by the water and I noticed a rash in my inner arm, seven or eight red bumps. At the time I thought they looked like braille and I remember wondering what they said. In a sense, trying to answer that question, what, what that message was, is the project um, I'm involved in now. Uh, when I got home from Vietnam, I became very sick. And it took three years, two years, I can't remember for doctors to figure out what was really wrong, um, which turned out to be several things. In the end, I was ultimately diagnosed with multiple autoimmune disorders, and then finally with Lyme disease, which had potentially helped trigger some of those. But before I got the Lyme diagnosis, and initially with the autoimmune diagnoses, nothing I did was making me feel better. So I ended up embarking on a very complicated, expensive, at times overwhelming, quest for answers for treatment and for recognition. Along the way, the meaning of what I think was that message on my arm changed, and that became what I've been calling for my own purposes, illness as semaphore, kind of play on Susan Sontag's idea of illness as metaphor. Um, the idea that in illness we find a system of metaphors and signs that we read into often mistakenly. So the, the less we understand about something happening, the more we psychologize or even stigmatize it. <coughs> And so that idea of Sontags will keep in the back of our minds. I should say, I have, a, I have slides. They're a bit approximate in places, so don't get too caught up in some of the details. If we'll talk more about that. Um, so one of the things I'm really interested in is the fact that the subjective experience of illness is all but impossible to convey. Long-term illness is hard to talk about with anyone who hasn't experienced it, even short-term illness, extreme short-term illness. My aim is to kind of find a spit of land connecting the chronically fatigued and mysteriously pain-ridden and those whose bodies are slowly demolishing themselves to the well. Um, it is an aim that is kind of foiled from the start because one of the problems with illness is the problem of representation. Um, but it's my job to try to build that. Illness is the sunset of our bodies, the place where life shifts into a permanent night. Mortality is the ultimate flaw in the machine. Illness is the reminder that we are all human, that we are embodied. So today I'm going to talk specifically about the rise of autoimmune disease and some of the reasons for that rise. And perhaps most interestingly, to me at least, how the stories we tell ourselves about these diseases shape our understanding of them. <laughs> My argument is that if every age has its representative, poorly understood, and highly symbolic disease, I would argue that ours is autoimmunity, um, in which the immune system mistakenly turns on the body's own healthy tissue and is no longer able to recognize the difference between what immunologists call self and non-self. So um, when I say every age has a poorly understood and highly symbolic disease, I'm thinking a lot of this book by Sontag that many of you may know called Illness as Metaphor, which was written after her own experience with cancer, which at the time, though it may seem strange to us now, faced many of the kinds of problems that people with autoimmune disease face. So her experience of being told that breast cancer was caused by her own stress, for example, um, gave rise to a book in which she tried to talk about how we psychologize disease, and I love these quotes. Nothing is more punitive, she wrote, than to give a disease a meaning. That meaning in being invariably a moralistic one, right? And she was also writing about tuberculosis and how in the 19th century, 
Tuberculosis patients were thought to be kind of spiritualized creatures. Um, that, you know, poets got tuberculosis. Um, it was thought to be a disease partly of the soul and spirit um, before they realized that in fact a bacteria caused it. So she's in the back of my mind here. <coughs> so I would say that today's, one of the things we do today is moralize or make stories out of autoimmunity. Um, so in autoimmunity, the cells fail to tolerate the very tissues and organs they are designed to protect, like soldiers who've unknowingly turned on the very fortress they're defending. And you see right away I've slipped into metaphor, right? Right away we start talking about the immune system. The whole idea of the immune system is itself a metaphor, and that in turn affects how we think of it. Autoimmunity is the largest category of chronic illness in the United States. It affects an estimated 50 million people, which is nearly one in six. It has a huge impact on healthcare costs and on people's livelihoods. Researchers who work on it describe it as a public health crisis. It is rising at what scientists call epidemic rates. So let's look at the next. So um, we have these definitions. When the body's immune system mistakenly attacks the body's own tissue, tissues, or as I say more poetically, the failure of the immune system to distinguish between, quote, self and non-self. And this is actually medical, even though I say more poetically, it's the early medical definitions of autoimmunity use this language of self and non-self. So here are some common autoimmune disorders. Um, some of them are more recognizable to us than others. Um, I'll turn on my other mic too. So we have things like uh, thyroiditis, psoriasis, rheumatoid arthritis, um, sarcoidosis, scleroderma, some of these, some of these I think um, are more familiar than others. You need to understand how to turn this on. Yeah. Okay. So, um, what's relevant to what I'm talking about is that the, there are estimated 80 to 100 disorders, um, but the rates are increasing, and the increasing rates can't nearly be explained by better diagnostics. As a Johns Hopkins researcher I talked to put it, it's quite alarming when we actually look at this trajectory, and we can see from perspective studies in Finland, from womb to tomb studies, that there is something going on here but besides diagnosis. Here we have a slide, it's not very statistically accurate, but just gives you a vague sense of what is happening. We see the rise, the overall rise in diseases like multiple sclerosis, asthma, which isn't actually an autoimmune disease, but is an immune-related one, diabetes, Crohn's disease. Um, so some of the things we have are that celiac disease, which is a, a, an autoimmune response to wheat, and, um, the wheat protein <coughs> has risen fourfold since the 1950s. Type 1 diabetes has risen fivefold in 40 years. It's up 23% in the last decade. Um, Mayo Clinic researchers report incidence of lupus has nearly tripled in the United States. Rates of MS are rising in Germany, Italy, Norway, Scotland, England, the Netherlands, Denmark, Sweden, and Greece, where MS rates have doubled over the past 30 to 40 years. Um, the NIH estimates that the annual direct healthcare costs of autoimmunity are $100 billion. That's not including work missed, care that has to be paid for, etc. And yet, and this is what I'm interested in, 85% of Americans can't name an autoimmune disease. Um, many think, for example, mistakenly that HIV or AIDS is an autoimmune disease. And much of the medical community still doesn't understand autoimmunity well. Early stage autoimmune disorders are often dismissed by doctors and looked on skeptically. Research is underfunded. So none of this is quite an accident. It reflects the fact, I argue, and I think, that the peculiar qualities of autoimmune disorders, especially in their less severe manifestations, expose many of the assumptions and limitations of our current medical system. Autoimmunity is a cultural phenomenon that raises complex and challenging questions about the social and historical construction of illness, the poorly understood relationship between mind and body, the difference between disease, the medical label we're given, and illness, which is one's day-to-day -day experience of disease. 
<coughs> so when we talk about autoimmunity, what do we mean? Here's a kind of crude, another crude slide. <coughs> um, in autoimmunity, something goes wrong with the normal immune response, and rather than create antibodies to external things, like a virus, the body creates autoantibodies, or antibodies to an organ or tissues of the person, him or herself. It's not totally clear to us yet how or why this mistake, quote unquote, gets made. Um, but we do know that autoimmune diseases are partly genetic and partly environmental. Um, genetic susceptibilities, one theory is that genetic susceptibilities are triggered by environment, such as a virus. As Noel Rose, who's a, uh, one of the people who discovered autoimmunity at Johns Hopkins, told me, the patient is the loaded gun, the virus pulls the trigger. And interestingly, right away, we're back in the land of metaphor to describe what, what is happening. Um, it's sort of a terrifying metaphor, the idea that your own body is the loaded gun. The rise of autoimmune disease does appear to be directly connected to environmental changes. This is sort of suggesting some interconnection of immune regulation, genes, and environment. Um, so what do we mean by environment? be all of these things. Viruses, pollutants, there are more than 100,000 new man-made chemicals, altered microbiome, we've been hearing a lot about the microbiome and how we're, we're not individuals anymore, we're republics, yes. Um, epigenetics, or the hygiene hypothesis, the idea that we're not exposed as much to um, dirt and things like that, and so therefore our, our immune system is looking for things to do. <coughs> Interestingly, autoimmune diseases are called Western diseases by many researchers because they happen much less often in developing countries. Evidence is mounting that specific changes, including the chemicals we've introduced to the environment and the hygienic environment um, and the diet heavy and processed foods, are playing a role, but what role? We don't exactly know. Again, this is one of the areas that we then can make a lot of meaning out of. Um, autoimmune, as some researchers say, is the new silent spring. Um, you may remember this book, famous book by Rachel Carson about environmental degradation. So although autoimmunity is the leading cause of chronic illness, it remains as much of a medical mystery today at our frontier as tuberculosis was in the 19th century. My own experience of feeling unwell for years before I got a diagnosis is actually quite typical. According to ARDA, which is the leading advocacy group, it takes an average of nearly five years and six doctors for a sufferer to be given a diagnosis. Because it can be systemic or affect multiple diagnoses, patients can end up consulting different specialists for different symptoms, a dermatologist, an endocrinologist, a neurologist, or a rheumatologist. Um, in this sense, the Western medical structure is challenging. We don't have autoimmune centers the way we have cancer centers. Um, one patient I talked to said she just felt like she was different parts of her body being sent here, there, and everywhere with no answer. <clears throat> so let's go back to that question I asked myself when I saw the rash. What, is this, what does it say? What is the message? It's actually a kind of strange question to ask about a disease. But as Sontag showed in Illness's Metaphor, um, we do seem to have an irresistible urge to make illness into symbols of other things. Tuberculosis, in other words, was seen as a disease of romantic young souls. There's a case here. No, I'm in a different place, so I'm just going to stay here. Um, we think of Keats. Cancer was seen as the consequence of repressed emotions. Psychologizing is something we do often to disease, but it happens particularly with autoimmune disease because I think the very nature of it seems metaphorical, the way that I myself lapsed into thinking of this fortress being attacked from the inside out. One of the things I've found as I've been working on this book and I interviewed patients is that they themselves identify the disease as a metaphor for their own inner struggles, even when they know that every woman in their family has had an autoimmune disease. As one patient who is a former anorexic explained to me recently, she said, quote, I almost feel like there is some sort of metaphor there with autoimmunity. Now my body is literally destroying itself. With other diseases, it's this kind of external thing you're fighting against. If you have cancer, you can fight your cancer. But if you have an autoimmune disease, what are you fighting against? Do you fight your own immune system? Are you your immune system? Are you the organ under attack? Who are you? 
So for many patients who suffer from an autoimmune disorder, the early experience is of having a question without an answer. While she's trying to get a diagnosis, and sometimes even afterward, her symptoms are seen by doctors, by herself, by her friends and family, as maybe a sign of her personality and psychological state, not as the early signs of disease manifesting itself. Often the patient seeking answers is told not to worry about her doctors or informed she just has to live with it. I'm trying to find. So that slide here, we see that one of the crucial things to know about autoimmunity is that 75% of autoimmune disease patients are women and 25% are men. <coughs> So this is my joke about um, doctors, right? <coughs> Only you can hear this whistle, right? Um, so this is, this is what happens to the autoimmune sufferer. Um, so often the patient who's seeking answers is told by a doctor that effectively she just has to live with it. I interviewed a woman I'll call Helen who told me about her experience. She um, said to me, quote, I got sick when I was 10 years old. My whole family caught the flu and I just never recovered. I had severe fatigue, swollen lymph nodes, swollen joints, stomach problems, shingles, and unceasing upper respiratory infections. I went undiagnosed for three years, during which time I saw countless doctors and was told I was making everything up more times than I care to remember. She was 10. My parents were told to treat me with, quote, tender, loving neglect. She ended up with multiple diagnoses and in a wheelchair in her 20s. Um, eventually, she actually did get well, get a diagnosis, and get well, but that period of time did not, did not obviously, obviously help her. So part of the challenge for the ill patient is that most of us think about disease based on a germ theory model. The body is attacked, and it defends, defends and it defeats the disease. You go to the doctor, you get medicine, you have surgery, and then you're done. In most chronic illnesses, including autoimmune disease, you come up against another reality. As Jill, who's a young professor, wrote to me, there's no paradigm for understanding chronic illness. Non-sick people think of illness as something from which you either recover or die. People with chronic illnesses never truly recover, but with any luck, they also don't die. We, at least not immediately. We exist in some alternate gray universe where there aren't many good answers, even to a simple question like, how are you? In my own experience, as I was ill, um, not sure what was happening. I hungered for certainties, even though I also realized that the experience itself was a morass of uncertainty. Um, it seemed to me no accident. This was my image that I often came back to of what I was trying to, where I was trying to go and the impossibility of actually getting there. <coughs> so to have an autoimmune disease, it came to seem to me was to be yourself while not being yourself, to be kind of self-confused your body was doing something to itself that it shouldn't be doing. In this way, autoimmunity has fascinating philosophical and literary implications. Who is it who is sick? And how much can we know about him or her, even if we are the person experiencing it? Is it a form of suicide, as the poet and writer Sarah Manguzo has suggested? Or is it the ultimate form of self-alienation? Is all of this reading into the disease way off base? Or are its triggers, in fact, as complex as what happens when you choose to walk out the door and pass by another person who sneezes and gives you a virus? That is to say, are we misled by the fact that it's our immune system into seeing significance and metaphor, where in fact there is merely an accident? So all of these murky issues are compounded by the fact that, as I mentioned before, most of the sufferers of autoimmune diseases are women. Um, we know that gender and race have real implications on care and medicine, and I want to just give you a couple quick examples. Um, medicine diagnosis uh, demonstrates cultural biases. So um, one of the arguments I make in my book is that our notion of the hysterical woman continues to inform the way that especially young women are treated when they go to the doctor. Um, crying, sobbing, laughing, she has no control of herself. The slightest thing drives her to distraction tired all the time, overwrought. If only she would give Lydia Pinkham the vegetable compound a chance to help her, how well and happy she might be. Right. Um, then there were these nerve and brain tablets. So hysteria was a female problem. This thing called neurasthenia was thought to be a, a male problem. We're going to talk a little bit more about it, but for the treatment and cure of men's special diseases. Um, and then one of my favorites, steady nerves. 
hello Mary, what's time? Well, hey, what's that noise? How can you say that? Oh, that's the children playing. Since I'm digging their right, nothing bothers me. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we, we see where history has its own ideas about illness. Um, so, we do know that medicine still demonstrates cultural biases, right? A 2001 study in the Journal of Law, Medicine, and Ethics found that women's pain reports are taken less seriously than those of men, and women receive much less aggressive treatment for their pain. Uh, another study showed women are more likely to be given sedatives and antidepressants, continuing this tradition, for pain, while men are more likely to be given pain medication for their pain. Um, another study of cancer care at seven clinics in California found that female cancer patients, this is really startling, female cancer patients were prescribed half the pain medication as male patients who reported the same pain intensity score. And that's with a disease that doctors know they have and know causes pain. Um, we know from other studies that the pain of black people is often taken as being less real. Um, you're less likely to be prescribed op opioids if you are an African-American patient. Um, and so what this suggests is that doctors, not just doctors, though all of us have difficulty accepting women's self-reports of illness symptoms, that your own testimony is taken as suspect, partly because of this, this history. So even when a woman finally has a diagnosis, autoimmunity, because it's still not seen as this hard objective disease, remains a kind of historically gendered soft disease, like these nerve problems. Um, so it is a, I've come to find that it's a truth universally acknowledged among chronically ill patients I've, been, I've been interviewed that a young woman in possession of vague and intermittent symptoms will be in search of a doctor who does not believe she is merely, quote, depressed. Um, my own doctors were mostly respectful and thoughtful and didn't imply that I was crazy, um, perhaps because I was very careful to present myself as analytical and humble and deferential to them, even when I felt the opposite, um, to the point that a rheumatologist once took out his reporter and while I was in his office, and he was like, I just gotta make my notes now. And he said that I was a, quote, young woman with a pleasant affect, presenting with symptoms in multiple systems, and I was so happy that he had described my affect as pleasant. I thought, okay, he's gonna listen to me. Um, but at first, my doctors, you know, they looked for something wrong, and then they didn't find it, and then they kind of dismissed me, I think, as one of the quote-unquote worried well, you know, that I seemed relatively well to them, and so they didn't take seriously the subjective reports of symptoms I had, um, precisely because they were subjective, right? There's no test for fatigue, there's no test for pain. So, even though med medicine practices science and prides itself on practicing science, we know that at times it is still practicing bias. Um, and this becomes really complicated for the patient to try to point out or to contend with. And if you think about it, we were just talking about this in a seminar earlier, it's somewhat amazing that doctors and many of us would believe that hundreds of thousands of young women are inventing their symptoms out of the need for attention or from anxiety or depression. You know, that we would have this much time to just go spend in really boring, depressing doctor's offices for the sake of attention. Um, recently, my grandmother and my father were telling me about my great aunt Gert and how much she liked to be sick. Uh, and it kind of got my back up because it was clear to me now, hard to diagnose retroactively, that she probably had multiple autoimmune disorders. There's a lot of autoimmune disease in, in my mother's family. Um, and, you know, but poor old Gert, you know, her whole life, she liked to be sick, oh, she likes the attention, she likes to be sick, she always seemed pretty nice to me. Um, so, of course, there are people out there who are hypochondriacs, and this is part of the complexity of us. But women, but science itself tells us that women are the overwhelming sufferers of autoimmune disease, that they are increasingly prevalent, and that they are notoriously hard to identify in blood work early on. Given that a modest estimate suggests one out of nine women, and a figure that the New Yorker fact checker and I came up with was more like one out of four, um, are going to develop an autoimmune disease, it would seem that the rational or scientific doctor ought to think to him or herself, this could be one of those patients. Instead, what I heard on the message boards I visited and the women I, from the women I interviewed was all these stories about being turned away. Even once women were identified, even once they were diagnosed with an illness, um, when they complained of their symptoms, I shouldn't even say complained, when they 
reported on their symptoms. Um, one doctor chidingly inquired was it whether she was not in fact depressed. So one of the problems we have is that when women are sick, often the first question we ask is not what's wrong with them, but why something is wrong with them. Um, so it's quickly seen as an expression of an emotional state, a need for attention, a boredom, um, one, one woman I interviewed who was a very distinguished artist had a car accident that caused widespread pain. It was finally diagnosed as a particular disorder of the nervous system, but when she went into her doctor's office, he said, oh, do you have boyfriend problems? Um, <clears throat> so the question is, where did this pervasive belief in the falsity of female illness derive from, and why does it persist? Um, partly, I think, because of this history of hysteria or the neurasthenic women. Interestingly enough, neurasthenia in its early days was an exclusively male disease of the nerves, but in our contemporary understanding of it, it's a female typology. If you Google the neurasthenic woman, you'll get many more hits saying, talking about the neurasthenic woman than the neurasthenic men. So there's a kind of historical irony here, maybe worth teasing out, which is that before Freud redefined hysteria and neurasthenia, these illnesses were really conceived of as physiological, not, not psychological. Um, it was thought that nerves could actually create malformations in the body, along with seizures, depression, anxiety. So there was a, a mental component and a physical, organic component. Um, hysteria often went along with things like pelvic lesions or numbness or migraines. <clears throat> so the treatment of the rescue was partly rooted in a real faith that something was wrong in the body as well as the mind. Since then, we've separated the physical and psychological, perhaps to an extreme extent, and hysteria came to be seen as the body's way of saying something that the mind, the person, couldn't say. Right? So sort of Freud's redefining of it that you know, women's testimony becomes suspect because they're unable to say what they really say, need to say, and their bodies are saying it for them, which is. There's something to it, but there's also something deeply pernicious about that gesture, that move of taking away the ability to testify on your own behalf. Um, you know, and partly what happened is that feminism also kind of rightly picked up on this idea that these diseases, this you know, epidemic of hysterical women was, was an expression of social ills, was an expression of repression. You know, Charlotte Perkins Gilman's The, well of the Yellow Wallpaper, you know, it was as an expression of mental distress, unconscious rebellion against an impressive patriarchy. But ironically enough, the rereading of the female illness, as important as it was, doesn't allow for the idea that maybe some of these women were actually sick. Um, so <clears throat> that's a very interesting thing. These illnesses now, these symptom-ridden bodies, are still read more as a semaphore or a sign for psychological distress rather than as symptoms disease. So when you go into a doctor's office and you're asked for um, what's wrong with you and you say that you're experiencing vague symptoms like fatigue or anxiety or pain, I think it's partly unconsciously viewed still as this kind of semaphore of psychological distress, even though that's not the doctor's training. So the legacy of hysteria also means that vague illness has somehow become feminized, um, the kind of thing that heart science doesn't like to deal with. Autoimmunity, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome, these are really today's hysteria. But we've forgotten the part where doctors originally thought there was a physiological problem at work. So one of the ways I think we know this is that these readings persist even after diagnosis. So a woman I talked to, I'm going to call her Emily, had since she was 14 a severe case of endometriosis, an immune-modulated disease where tissue from the uterus ends up coating other organs. It can be extremely painful and hard to diagnose without doing surgery. So she was given the diagnosis of stage four quite advanced disease after passing out on the street one day. By that time, she also had a history of depression. Perhaps unsurprisingly, she had endured incredible pain with no understanding of why. Um, she also then contracted Lyme disease, and she started having many different small problems, confusion, joint pain, brain fog. But as she told me, when I started presenting to doctors with multiple symptoms and multiple systems, I saw that this became, quote, hypochondria. I was so aware of the labeling that I would lie. I would hold back details so they would believe me. 
If I didn't, the doctors would just look at me like I was crazy. They kept trying to suggest my pain was in my head, even though they had my diagnosis. I'd say, no, my organs are stuck together. It was just a physical reality. So all of this is compounded by the fact that we don't have a clear sense of what causes autoimmunity. Um, and I'm gonna wrap up in a few minutes. Um, but to sort of take us through some of the models that we use to think about disease. Um, one of the results is that the person suffering from chronic illness, in my experience, faces a difficult balancing act. You have to be an advocate for yourself in the face of medical ignorance or indifference or arrogance, um, or goodwill, but a lack of training. One 2004 Johns Hopkins study found that nearly two-thirds of doctors surveyed felt inadequately trained in treatment of chronically ill patients. It's a huge percentage, two-thirds. Um, you can't be deterred as a patient when you know something is wrong. You also have to be willing to ask how much is in your head and whether an obsessive attention to your symptoms is going to lead you to better health. It's a really tricky balancing act. And I think worrying about being crazy is part of many autoimmune sufferers' lives. Even after diagnosis, you're often trapped in an epistemological maze, not least because autoimmune diseases tend to overlap. You need to monitor, adjust, and take care of yourself without worrying too much. The chronically ill patient, I came to think, has to hold in mind two contradictory modes, insistence on the reality of her disease and resistance to her own catastrophic fears. So one question for us is why does the standoff between patients and doctors matter? What is it really that's at stake here? And there's a couple things. First, and we've been talking about this a little bit this afternoon, it makes a big difference to the patient's experience. A diagnosis can be a great relief. We have a need for knowledge. There's a wonderful like, historical example of this. Henry and William James's sister Alice, who was sick for many years, um, had been told again and again that her illnesses were just in her head. She was diagnosed as hysteric. This is in the 19th century. She wrote in her diary, Ever since I've been ill, I've longed and longed for some palpable disease, no matter how conventionally dreadful the label it might, a label it might have. Finally, she was diagnosed with breast cancer, hardly a diagnosis that people greet with joy. Um, and she wrote in her diary with an exclamation point, to him who waits, all things come. So think about it. She was actually happier to be told she had breast cancer and was near death which was what she was told, than to live without a diagnosis. It's a very, very powerful fact. She had struggled alone for so long under what she called, quote, the monstrous mass of subjective sensations um, that she felt personal responsibility for what was happening. But it's worth underscoring that what is needed here, that what the patient needs, that being heard is not just an emotional need. It's also a practical, physical one. Of course, what's not being taken seriously is an actual disease. This matters because it takes so long for diagnosis to happen, if it happens at all, that in most cases, enormous amounts of damage have been done by the time the patient is treated. Um, and finally, we're starting to understand that things we've traditionally separated are turning out to be much more intertwined when it comes to living with disease and when it comes to medicine than we understand. So as it turns out, having an empathetic doctor is helpful both emotionally and physically. To give a startling example, studies show that diabetes patients have much better outcomes with high empathy doctors. The improvement in their condition is so extreme that it is equivalent to their improvement on the most powerful drugs. The effects of empathy, in other words, are real and they're also measurable. Um, at the same time, some doctors think it's wrong to even tell a patient that she has an autoimmune disease because there is nothing to be done about it. I spoke to a practitioner recently who made a GI doctor very angry after telling a patient that her disease was autoimmune. The doctor said, why did you tell her that? You're just going to upset her. Um, but this strikes me as being quite paternalistic. It's certainly against the trajectories of patients' rights over the past 40 years, and it adds to the cost burden of the healthcare system. Um, but of course, the concern that we might mull obsessively over our diseases isn't totally unreasonable. Um, as Norton Hadler, a rheumatologist at UNC Chapel Hill, has written about, 
there are consequences to what we call negative labeling. If you give a person a diagnosis, they tend to feel sicker than they did without one. So one of the questions we have to think about is how do we use diagnosis usefully if we don't have treatment? Um, but the con another consequence of all the misreading of the body is late diagnosis and under-treatment. Feeling unserved by medicine, people flee to the internet and online communities um, for companionship and information, but as we may know, a lot of unhelpful information is passed around on the internet, shockingly. Um, so it's very important to think about how we can usefully give name and shape and representation to things we don't yet fully understand. And here's an example of one of the consequences. Um, Helen, the woman who got sick when she was 10 and whose parents were told, her, told to treat her with tender, loving neglect, told me, the years of being told that my body wasn't feeling what I knew it was feeling really kind of screwed me over. That insecurity about what should be the most basic, question, unquestionable relationship with my own body lingers to this day. So obviously one issue is that our system is preoccupied with interventions in the case of, quote, body failure, as the founder of a large medical, um, one of our large medical groups put it to me. In our body failure system, we're great at repairing a torn out, AC, blown out ACL, or targeting heart failure, and all sorts of things. Um, we can resuscitate somebody, we can do many extraordinary things in, 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 that require radical intervention. But we don't know how to deal with these more slow growing, hard to identify, hard to treat disease. And part of the problem I think we have, to, one question we have to ask ourselves is, you know, in some sense whether we have a bias against the sick. Whether we think of the sick as inherently able to judge for themselves as being desperate for answers, especially in cases where they aren't going to get better. Do we see their inability to get better as being their own responsibility? And are we really only comfortable with illnesses that are going to end because, as a philosopher friend of mine put it, you know, the illness of others, the needs of others are burdensome to us, and it's our responsibility to think about what is the nature of that burden and the moral weight of that burden, our moral responsibility. Um, the sociologist Paul Starr, who's written incredibly insightfully about the healthcare system, actually says in his book, the sick are ordinarily not the best judge of their own needs, right? So we really have this idea that the sick are not could, um, they are not able to be test to testify on their own behalf. We still talk about medicine in terms of authority models. You know, we'll say the patient is, quote, non-compliant. Um, in literature, the sick person is often an unreliable narrator. Um, you know, often he or she is mistaking a spiritual malaise for a disease, as in Thomas Mann's The Magic Man. We still have this, this model. So part of what I'm calling for in the book and, and trying to trace is a more capacious understanding of illness and a generosity of spirit toward those whose symptoms often seem hard to pin down and whose spirits may be as restive and needy as their bodies. I want to try to complicate our more black and white thinking about the relationship between psychology and disease. One of the hardest things about being chronically ill is that most people find what they're going through incomprehensible if they believe you are going through it at all. In your loneliness and your preoccupation with an enduring new reality, you want to be understood in a way that you can't be. Quote, pain is always new to the sufferer, but it loses its originality for those around them. Him, the 19th century French writer Alphonse Daudet observes in his account of living with syphilis. Everyone will get used to my pain except me. So there is, of course, a loneliness to illness and a desire to be seen. Um, but you know, part of the difficulty is in that act of representation. Where do we find a language for, um, for the experience that will allow it to be seen and recognized? And what is the job of the medical system? Is it just to name and diagnose, or is it also actually to recognize, right, and to make space for? So um, just in wrapping up, I'll, I'll say that um, I think that looking back in my own life, there was this period where I was very interested in fate, and I thought that my fate was going to be that I would get sick very young, this was when I was a teenager, and at the time I thought I was a hypochondriac, and I still think I was. But um, it was very interesting to me that I became sick, because that, that habit of thinking when I became sick 
part of the subjectivity that I'm interested in was that I thought, oh, I'm just a hypochondriac. Everyone feels these things, these aches, these pains, this incredible fatigue, but I just pay more attention to them. And it was like being a frog in a boiling pot of water where it took so long to realize that something was itself wrong. Um, and it makes me wonder when the autoimmune processes in my body began, when the tick that had Lyme disease bit me, because I had it for a long time before I was ultimately given treatment and got much, much better. Um, these are the kinds of speculations that I can't help making as a patient, you know, and that there is a kind of magical thinking that the patient, him or herself, has, you know, will this pill protect me from cancer? Will the spell work? Um, and this is precisely what annoys doctors about patients like me, but I think it is uh, part of our way of dealing. You know, Joan Didion, the writer, says we tell ourselves stories in order to live, and stories are crucial, they're crucial to our understanding, but we have to decide which stories we're going to tell ourselves, and we have to try to make those stories as accurate as possible in order to understand the most, and really to bring about the best possible endings for the most possible people, and that's part of why I'm telling this story. So thank you so much. Sir? 
That's a great question, and overutilization is obviously a really huge um, issue for us to think about. Ironically, certainly in my experience, I was like the test case of overutilization. It was like they did every, every you know, and you're sent from specialist to specialist, and each specialist would say, well, I don't know, you do those labs a month ago, I'm going to redo them. I mean, they did every test they could possibly do over and over and over and over in a very ineffective way. So, I mean, I actually would argue that it's, there is a systemic fix that needs to happen that when dealing with something like autoimmunity, you would have less overutilization. And we probably have a lot of overutilization in the attempt to diagnose autoimmune disease that's done poorly. And then in other cases, under, as you're saying, and then in other cases, you get a doctor who happens to be like, no, I'm not doing that test because you're probably fine, you're just tired. So I think it goes in both directions. And um, obviously, one of the things we need is better tests. Right, we need funding for better tests, and we need, um, I do think that part of what we need is a space for the patient to come to understand that there isn't necessarily a test for what she has yet. And that doesn't mean that maybe in two years something won't turn up, but right now there isn't an answer. And that kind of conversation is very hard to have, I think, for doctors, because they are so under pressure and burned out. So I think that medical reform and better education for both doctors and patients should actually help reduce overutilization and end up with better diagnostics in the end. Yeah, that would be my hope. Yeah. There's a question back here. Thank you so much. Uh, my dad has a form of autoimmune arthritis, and last year I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease, so you kind of put words to a lot of the things that I've been feeling over the last year or so. Um, my question for you is, what have you, been, what have you seen being done in med schools and residency programs to train doctors to deal with chronic illness and to have more empathy, and what more work do you think needs to be done? It's a great question, and I don't have as complete an answer for you as I'd like, because that's the chapter I haven't written yet. <laughs> One of several chapters. Um, but preliminarily, I've done a bit of work um, in, for a piece I wrote in the Atlantic Monthly about the kind of problems and the structure of the healthcare system, and um, about empathy. There's very interesting work being done about how you know young doctors how people in medical school are introduced to hospital settings and the ways in which that um, transmission of knowledge happens and whether their superiors are kind of indifferent to other patients or caring about other patients really affects their own empathy levels. And one of the scary things is that many um, med students who as soon as they're doing rounds in hospitals lose their empathy right away. So we, I have thought of empathy, the decline in empathy, as an effect of burnout over a longer period of time. It actually seems to happen immediately, which suggests that there's something about a transmission of attitudes and something structural that can be fixed, which is actually quite encouraging. And I think that at Columbia and at Harvard, they are actually working very much to try to identify and think about this. So clearly, I mean, we were talking about this in the seminar earlier. I mean, I think that one thing that should happen is that aspiring med students, you know, should make it known that this is something that they care about, right? That the market needs to shift and say, you know, I don't want to end up a burned out, depressed doctor two years in. You know, I want, you know, I want to be able to be a human and to do, to do this work, which is challenging even in the best of circumstances because of the demands that um, doctoring places, which are tremendous, tremendous human demands, emotional demands. Um, about autoimmunity, you know, it's much, much more teaching needs to be done. I mean, I talked to somebody at Harvard a while ago, who, you know, it was a very tiny part of the, of the, I don't know, maybe I could be misremembering who, it was someone who um, did curriculum who was telling me that, and it might not have been at Harvard, who was telling me that autoimmunity was just a really tiny part of, of the curriculum and they were working to change that. So, you know, I don't, I need to go look into how that is in the curriculum, but some of the places I've talked to, it's a very small part of the curriculum um, rather than a larger. And since it's a phenomenon, um, you know, I still think some of these diseases are taught as uh, discrete diseases rather than as a phenomenon that's being studied. Here and then there. Um, okay, we'll reverse the 
you mentioned in your New Yorker piece that there's a kind of typical format to a lot of illnesses and therefore illness memoirs moving from diagnosis to recovery, but for autoimmune disorders it's often quite different and you have episodic kind of flare-ups and I was wondering if that experience informed the structure of your memoir and more broadly what kind of forms you found to you know, talk about your experience. It's a great question, we were just talking about this. It's been really challenging, part of why the book is still being written. Um, it's very challenging. It's very challenging to find a form that, because I do think writing needs form, right? It, it, we, we do need to make some kind of story out of what has happened, and I'm reluctant to make an oversimplified story. In a weird way, I actually ended up with a more traditional illness narrative, which is that when I got diagnosed with Lyme disease and treated, I did get much, much better, um, which was after the New Yorker article. And that has almost caused a little bit more hesitation for me because I don't want to, I, I, I really want this book to reflect something about that continuity and cyclical nature of illness. Um, so it's a struggle. It's a struggle to find that form that, that is sort of aesthetically representative of what's happening, but also bring us to some kind of close. And one thing I found myself doing before going back to the memoir was writing a series of kind of poem essays where I really felt like I was able to find a much more fractured, elliptical form that felt to me representative of the uncertainty of the experience um, in a way that was really important to me as a writer, just to find that form and to find that voice and to find that fragmentation, and I think will allow me in the nonfiction memoir to be a bit more structured because it's a book that's hopefully also transmitting a lot of information. Um, but it was like the, the patient in me also needed to write this other kind of writing that was very anti-teleological and still embedded in its own confusion in some way. I think I've done it by dividing myself in some sense. Yeah. You have brought up me. You know, if I understand correctly, uh, this one of the central physiological processes of autoimmune disorders is inflammation. But I wonder if you know that word has encoded in it a, a, a metaphor of, of burn, of fieriness, which strikes me as sort of serving us poorly. Because I mean I mean literally just be swelling, right? And also, you know, the implications of fieriness of like of hell of, and, and also of quick destruction, which isn't really is there is there a metaphor that you use that that actually might both describe what's happening physically and what it feels like to you? That's a great question, right? Because it is the doctors will say, oh, this is inflammation, and that is what you're told. You have chronic inflammation in different ways. Um, you know. The other metaphor I think people use, and that certainly I've used, is this idea of the overactive and the underactive, right? My immune system is overactive. Parts of it, technically, according to my doctors, the language they would say is that parts are overactive and parts are underactive. Um, but I'm not sure whether that helps us either, though that's more, it's a little more neutral than inflammation is, and maybe a little bit more specific in terms of talking about actual numbers of kinds of cells you have. Um, but I haven't come across other metaphors than inflammation, and of course inflammation is very much kind of in popular culture right now, right, as a kind of um, something we should all watch out for, which it is, but <laughs> yeah. Well, and it reminds me of another metaphor that is an issue, which is that, you know, you often hear that stress causes disease, and you know, I was very stressed when I was sick, and I had a lot of work to do that was harder to do, and I remember finally saying to my doctor, or, you know, there's some day where I, like, ran to catch the bus, and I was stressed out catching the bus, and I remember saying to my doctor, like, I just ran to catch the bus, like, if I make myself more sick, and she was like, you know, there's a fundal mis fundamental misunderstanding of stress and disease, you know, the level of the kind of stress that we're talking about that would actually result in disease is really more like the stress of an infection or the stress of war, or the stress of, you know, um, abuse, or, you know, and that was a very helpful, I think one place of a lot of shadiness in our, in our metaphors or in our kind of systems of thinking is in this question of stress and what 
you know, and obviously chronic stress is not good, the chronic stress of catching the bus, but there is a bit of a, you know, you can't have like a bad day and then get, give yourself a kidney stone, I don't think, the next day, which one of my students recently told me it happened to her, and I was like, I think it's a little more complicated than that, but <laughs> check with your doctor. <laughs> Um, thank you for sharing your story. I want to make a couple of comments, both um, as a nurse, a long-time nurse, a uh, healthcare provider, and also a daughter of a father who died of lupus when he was 40 years old, a white Irishman. So I was just thinking that we're very uncomfortable with uncertainty, and I think as humans, and we need to know why things happen is this strong need to categorize also. So for example, when I see the statistics of lupus, and it's almost always women of color, I think, well, what about my dad? <laughs> you know? um, but, um, and I also think as a healthcare provider, it's so much easier to think about curing someone, you know, than managing a chronic disease. Um, and I think about, um, just the stress on the healthcare provider, I'm, I'm looking at it from their point of view right now too, of taking care of a patient who has a chronic disease that you don't understand and you feel like you can't help them. So you feel like a failure also as a provider when you can't make somebody feel better. And that's a very uncomfortable feeling to sit with as a healthcare provider. And lastly, I would say, you know, in any disease, you have to follow the money. Um, and this becomes very political. Um, even in diseases that we do understand more about, like cancer, there's been great strides made in the last 30 years with breast cancer, but that's because of money that was dedicated to research. That's no accident. Um, very little progress has been made with pancreatic cancer, which is a cancer I'm very familiar with for other reasons, because um, there's very little money if you look at the NIH budget. And the reason there's little money for pancreatic cancer, for example, is that people don't survive that. So you don't have an army of survivors who are marching in the streets. So I guess I'm gonna end with, um, <laughs> we all need to be really aware of what's happening to the NIH right now. Um, because if there's no money to do research, um, you won't make strides in, in any diseases, and I think Honestly, autoimmune diseases, because they're so chronic, um, are probably the least poorly funded diseases for research that um, exist. So, um, write your Congress people, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. I think those are all really, really important points. Um, yeah, they're wonderfully, wonderfully said. Yeah. Do we have? Um, Thank you very much for your very insightful presentation. I was going back to what you presented in the beginning, the self and the self-attacked. And I was trying to think if there is a way in which, uh, if I try to place myself in the situation of uh, someone suffering from an autoimmune disease, if there is a way in which there's an alternative between the two, because I don't have any more myself. And is the only possibility that I have it is that my own self is attacking myself. So I wanted to ask you about the way in which somehow the image of myself changed and I need to come to terms with it. So I need to find a way to deal with it, to accept it, while I'm trying to find a way to see if it's possible to do something to address the change. So it, there are two dynamisms, it seems to me, and I want to, to hear from you if you think they are helpful or not. And I'm saying this because I have in front of myself experiences of persons who resist even to accepting this idea of being sick, being sick yeah. of having something that is limiting yeah. their within. And the only image that they have themselves is the self that they don't have anymore, because now they are sick. Yes. And then, uh, as an aside, I was shocked by the biases that do highlight. highlight. Mm -hmm. Now, medicine is changing, 
and more women are in healthcare. In your experience, do we find a greater empathy if the healthcare professional or the physician is a woman? Mm -hmm. Or, as you were saying before, a B doesn't, a gender doesn't count. Yeah. What counts is education that uh, we receive in uh, medical uh, institutions. So on the gender and empathy, I mean, <laughs> I experienced empathy for me, it was not gendered. Although it, it is true probably that my two most, the two doctors who, the first doctor who took seriously what I was saying was a woman. Um, but I, I don't know, I would have to look into whether there's, there's studies of that. And I, I know there is work on, to, in, in, you know, are women more accepting of uncertainty and subjective responses? That's a really good question. I didn't notice a particular difference in my experience. Um, it kind of seemed more like were they having a bad day or a good day, you know how how evil, you know if you think about what you were just talking about about uncertainty and the ability to sit with that, like it is hard to deal with someone else's pain and needs and not be able to help them in the way you've been trained to help them. And I sometimes felt it really depended on whether my doctor was having a good day or a bad day, how much she could hear from what I was saying. Um, back to the self and the non-self, I think. I don't know if I'm answering your question, but one of the challenges for me when I was first sick and I was very ill and I knew I had something autoimmune but they couldn't really help me was, and it goes back to this question of stress, for me the self, non-self was very connected to this idea that I had sort of stressed myself too much. You know, I had one thing that you hear a lot is worked, especially as a woman, that you worked too much, um, that you, pushed yourself too hard, that you, etc., which was probably true, but it was very complicated to hear. And so there was, for me, this sense that I tried to write about in the New Yorker piece of having to come to terms with a new self that was, that was sick, right? That I couldn't behave in the way that I once had. I couldn't do what my peers were doing. That was one of the very challenging things for me was I can't do what everyone else is doing because I have this limitation. Um, but for me, I think the self, non-self, you know, the self attack myself was a bit pernicious because it did make me feel responsible somehow, you know, that I felt like I should be able to kind of quiet my immune system. It often, you know, also the problem of metaphor as opposed to, you know, it can be useful in this, it can be not useful, is that it opens you up to, you know, I saw a lot of different kinds of practitioners and healers, some of whom were really not doctors at all, but were, you know, nutritionists or spiritual healers or whatever, you know, you're desperate, you see all sorts of people, and I do think that metaphor opens up to people who aren't really going to help you a lot of room for them to kind of blame you or tell you that you're somehow responsible for your own illness, not, not even not explicitly, but implicitly. Um, you know, I remember one person told me I thought too much, and that was my problem, so, you know, and I remember sitting there thinking, well, I think too much, I have to stop thinking so much, but I'm thinking so much about not thinking, and, you know, it's just, so I don't know if that answers your question, but I think it's a really complicated, and I see this on the message boards, I see women, you know, going through this problem of um, feeling responsible for that self-attack. And it's very interesting because you think of cancer, I mean, I find it quite interesting that we think of cancer as being, um, you know, an alien invader or something of it. Because actually cancer cells are our own cells too. So why is autoimmunity our self attacking ourselves, and why is cancer the alien invader that we must conquer? I mean, there, there's really not that much difference. Um, I think it's because we have this idea of the immune system and because this early language that immunologists used of self and non-self really affected the way we consider autoimmunity. Yeah. Thank so you. Let's, let's pause there and join me in thanking